Very good morning, everyone. Welcome back again. This uh, second session of this uh, second day. We are going to talk uh, about the future of uh, Arab-Indian relations uh, with regard to energy and other issues. So we have uh, three speakers. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Azhar is going to speak about uh, Arab-Indian uh, relations in, in, with regard to energy and other dimensions. Uh, second, Mr. Nasser Tamimi, increase of uh, energy consumption in India opportunities uh, for Arab countries and then Girga Shepam is going to talk about uh, the change in context of uh, Arab uh, Indian energy uh, relations with regard to energy as you know India relies on uh, more than 50 percent of its uh, needs uh, from imports from Arab uh, countries uh, and also other products uh, closely related uh, to oil. Apart from that, uh, India is exporting uh, labor to Arab uh, countries uh, and is also relying on uh, remittances, remittances uh, to India, knowing that uh, there are more than one million uh, Indian workers in the region. There are a lot of changes with regard to energy production and this uh, brings about a lot of uh, challenges uh, for India and for Arab uh, countries. Uh, we start uh, with the presentation of Dr. Muhammad uh, Azhar. Muhammad uh, Azhar is professor of uh, economics uh, in the Department uh, of uh, West uh, Asian Studies uh, in uh, Aligarh University. He participated uh, in many studies uh, related uh, to the Gulf uh, region. Uh, he worked also as a consultant uh, in the uh, Indian Council uh, for uh, Arab Bursaries. Uh, he holds a PhD in international investment uh, in Arab countries from uh, Aligar Islamic University. Dr. Muhammad uh, Azhar, the floor is yours. At the outset, uh, I must thank the organizers who have given me this opportunity to present my paper here. Well, you can look at the structure of my paper. The reforms which were started about 30 years ago, three de decades ago, in Indian economy has bared the fruit and India has become the third economic power. Next to China and United States, India has third GDP, of course, when estimated in the purchasing power parity. And, uh, and India has left behind in the, in the growth, economic growth, China also and become the fastest growing economy. With the higher growth in economy, the requirement of oil and gas has grown very high. India has significant volume of human resources, both skilled and semi and unskilled. In a short growing economy like India, the vast resource base and a huge market, it is suitable enough to generate unlimited opportunities of economic cooperation. The Arab countries, they have reach of the hydrocarbon resources, oil and gas. Between them, they have about 56% of global oil reserves and 28% of global gas reserves. Some of the Arab countries, especially the Maghrib, they, are rich, they have rich deposits and exporter of phosphates and potash. We look at the different India's trade with different regions. We find that the Arab countries have are second to the different regions. 
the, f the Northeast Asia, that is China, which includes China, Japan, and Korea, has the largest economic relations with, the, with India, whereas the Arab world comes next. However, this, this is for the, for the year 16-17, and these years, the lower Isle revenues have reduced the share of Arab countries in Indian trade. So maybe it increases. The next table provides India's exports, imports, and India's total trade with Arab countries. We find that by 1213 it was maximum. However, it has been reducing. This can be looked at from this graph. And it is also because of the declining oil revenues, the imports that India imported did was the revenue came down and also the exports that were dependent upon the oil revenues, they also came down. Next is the uh, cooperation in the en energy sector. India's trade with the, these Arab countries consists of both energy and non-energy trade. Due to domestic unavailability of oil reserves, India has to import about 85% of its crude oil requirement from abroad. And of course, these are Arab countries who, who have been the, the most reliable source of imports of oil to India. The table, next table gives the, import, gives the data about the oil imports to, to Arab world. We find that the, about 55% of the oil coming to India is from the Arab world. Whereas, looking at, the, uh, looking at the petroleum products, we find that in this also, about 45% of imports of India come from the Arab world, come from the Arab world. Of course, this constitutes a small proportion of the India, India, India's total trade. India's imports of in petroleum gas and gaseous hydrocarbons are also dominated by the Arab countries, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and UAE are the largest exporters. 35%, 30, about 80% of the gas imports comes from the Arab world to India. Saudi Arabia and Iraq are the largest supplier, first and second, of oil to India. Then, the Although India is perceived and is known as only the energy importer, we have been of late, India has been exporting the petroleum products also. What is found that, what is found that the, the Arab countries, they have been importing about 20% of India's exports of the oil products, petroleum products, UAE, United Arab Emirates, Oman, and Saudi Arabia have been the large importers of petroleum products from India. So what we find that Arab countries have very important role in India's energy security. However, initially this was a buyer-seller relationship. This relationship is gradually changing. Now there are many developments, like Saudi Arabia has launched its Indian subsidiary, Aramco Asia India, and it has been negotiating refineries and going to the, to the, uh, to the distribution sector also, and also fuel retailing chain also. It has, India is UAE with Kuwait, with Iraq, even with Sudan, with Qatar, with Kuwait, with all these countries, India has now is, is, is becoming very active in cooperative or in getting partnership. And it is being observed that the energy relations between India and the Arab countries are changing beyond the seller-buyer framework. The relationship in the energy sector is poised to transform into deeper partnership involving investment in joint ventures in upstream, midstream, and downstream sectors in India. Arab countries and other countries also. 
the process has to be steady. The global nature of oil market would be a facilitator in this pop in this process. Next, we come to the to the to the non-energy sector. Uh, we find that the 68% of India's imports from Arab world consist of energy, whereas about 32% of India's imports from Arab countries consists of non-energy commodities also, meaning that one-third of India's imports is non-energy commodity also. So uh, as far as India's exports to the Arab world are concerned, about 12% of it consists of energy, whereas 88% consists of the non-energy. So in the, in, the, in the final estimate, about 45% of India Arab trade consists of energy commodities, whereas 55% of India Arab trade consists of non-energy commodities. The Arab countries of Maghrib are major source of phosphate and fertilizer imports for India. The, the, the The India's imports of natural calcium phosphates ground and unground, about 80% of both of these calcium phosphate come from the Arab world, especially Jordan, Morocco, Jordan and Morocco. India's import of phosphoric acid, about 62% of it comes from the Arab world, especially from the Morocco. And India's reports of diammonium, diammonium phosphate, about 30% of it comes from the Arab world, mainly from, from Saudi Arabia. So thus, it is clear that the Arab countries are very important source of India's fertilizer import requirement. The importance of Arab countries is quite evident for India's agriculture sector. The Arab countries are not only important for India's energy security, but also these countries are crucial to agriculture sector in India and have an important role in India's food security. And uh, then next comes the India's export of non-energy commodities to Arab world, because Arab world has been a good market for India's exports. About 62% of India's export of basmati rice goes to the Arab markets. About 24% of meat of bovine animals goes to the Arab markets. And about 38% of edible fruits and nuts goes to the Arab markets. About 30% of apples and clothing accessories knitted or corseted goes to the Arab markets. About 26% of apparel and clothing accessories not knitted or corseted goes to the Arab markets. So the importance of Arab market is very clear, must be very clear to, to all of us. And in addition to this, the, there have been very, very active, very increased activity in various collaborations in the, in the, in the investment in joint ventures and infrastructure and in many other things, India and the Arab countries are now participating in a larger way, a, a, a very, very, very good trend, of course. Looking at the balance of trade, because balance of trade is also important. If the trade is not balanced, then of course the party which suffers deficit will, will, have, will, 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 will have a kind of negative feeling. But we, what we find that India has been, has been having a very large deficit all the years vis-a-vis -vis the Arab countries taken together. However, it is not true for all the Arab countries. In fact, India had suffered the, the, the balance of payments deficit with the large, large oil exporting countries or gas exporting country like Iraq, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, etc. Whereas with all other con Arab countries, India had a positive surplus in balance, especially United Arab Emirates and uh, Oman and Egypt. India had very good surplus. Well, next section is on the, on the manpower cooperation. 
there were many, many papers in the manpower cooperation in yesterday's proceedings. So I will restrict myself just to look at the data. We find that about 8.5 million Indians are, non, in, are in employed in Arab countries. This is a huge, huge, uh, say, say, market. And this is a huge uh, benefit that India has with the Arab countries. Employing 8.5 million people is not a joke, is not an easy thing. So India has a large interest and, of course, crucial interest in the employment of Indians in Arab countries. Who sent remittances to back to the country and which are far superior than the FDIs that we have been attracting and we have been taking all the steps for that. Looking at the data at table 15, what we find that, what we find that the remittances have come down, of course. But what I was uh, uh, wondering to see that the remittances, the share of remittances from the Arab world has not declined so steep. What we find that the, the share, despite the declining, declining, despite, despite the declining uh, uh, remittance inflows to India, the remittance inflow from the Arab world has been, percentage-wise, has been increasing. This is, this is a very, very perplexing fact, of course, which needs further investigation by me or anybody else. So this is also a very, very positive development. And with this, I come to the conclusion that Arab countries in general and the Arab countries from Gulf in particular are crucial for India's energy security. India is a very important market for Arab oil exporting countries. Arab countries are also important for India's agriculture and food security. The Arab Maghrib countries play a special role in India's agriculture and food security. Arab countries are very important markets for India's exports. Although energy constitutes the backbone of India-Arab relations, but non-energy components cannot be neglected. The remittance sent by Indians employed in Arab countries and Gulf are very useful for Indian economy. Indians play a very important role in development of Arab economies, be it in Asia or Africa. Indo-Arab relations are transforming into all compassing strategic relations. This was all the rosy picture, but there are some limitations also to India-Arab relations, economic relations especially. Number one, there has been very less proportional utilization of the potential of Indo-Arab economic cooperation. The potential, the potential is very huge and that has been realized very less. Second, I blame both the public and private sectors in India and the Arab countries for this underperformance. It's not only public or it's not only private sector, but both these sectors can be, are responsible for this underperformance. And finally, the final point is that despite all these very, very good relations, very huge relations, very large relations, still we don't have India and Arab countries as a whole or India with any, any individual Arab countries we do not have any institutional arrangement like a free trade agreement. Hmm? By to this day, up to this day, India or Arab countries individually or in total, we do not have any institutional arrangement like free trade agreement. With this, I thank you very much to you for listening to me patiently and again thanks to the organizers for giving me this opportunity. I think I will really be thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Azhar. Please. Thank you also for your time management. Uh, now we move uh, to the second speaker, Dr. Nasser Tamimi. Uh, Dr. Nasser Tamimi, Hassel Ala Shahadat.
and he is an independent researcher based in the UK and he has the PhD in international relations from Durham University in Britain. His research interests focus on areas such as energy policies in the Gulf and Iran and Asian Gulf relations, especially with China. He authored the book China-Saudi Arabia Relations, 90-2012, Marriage of Convenience of Strategic Alliance, published by Routledge in English in 2013. He will take, talk about increasing energy consumption in India, challenges and opportunities for the Arab Gulf states. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Doctor. And uh, I thank uh, the uh, Arab Center for his invitation, and peace be upon you. My paper, my Dr. Muhammad, uh, focused in on the relations between uh, India and Arab countries, and my work is uh, focusing on India Gulf countries, and especially the energy. And the purpose is to strengthen the cooperation between India and these uh, Gulf countries and the possibility for them to be uh, developed further. And we try to deal with the challenges uh, for the development of these relations. And uh, I end up uh, with uh, some suggestions in order to boost uh, these uh, relations between the two parties. The first point is about the importance of uh, the Arab Gulf countries uh, uh, for India. The first uh, fee uh, uh, element is uh, the uh, energy, of course, resources, 60 percent uh, of the trade is in the energy products. The importance of uh, the Gulf countries, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia is the uh, biggest um, uh, exporter of uh, petrol, Qatar of gas, and uh, the Gulf uh, GCC countries are the biggest provider of uh, uh, energy resources uh, and this uh, uh, table mentions uh, five uh, uh, exporters the gulf countries provide uh, around the third of the indian needs most of the uh, liquefied LNG is from Qatar. Saudi Arabia was first in uh, uh, oil, but Iraq is now uh, uh, first. The other uh, uh, element is about the manpower, and the uh, Gulf countries are very important. In 2017, 31 30 million 31 million Indians work abroad and eight and a half million of them are in the Gulf countries on these 28 uh, percent sent to India 56 percent of the uh, transfers of money to India. This is very important uh, now for India. The third element are the Gulf markets, which are the biggest market of the Indian exports. And this is a very important uh, indicator for uh, Indian economy and for exporters. Fourteen percent. Uh, all the tables are from the uh, uh, IMF. Uh, 
For the trade, we have this table which uh, reflects the importance of uh, Gulf countries for India and vice versa. Individually, the Emirates are number four and uh, Saudi are number five. India are the fourth trade, biggest trade partner in the world for those uh, GCC countries. There are other important elements. It's the uh, energy, security, petrochemicals, uh, oil, gas, and uh, the GCC countries play an important role in this regard. And also the security and safety of maritime uh, routes and uh, Oman now, especially if we, uh, with reference to the fears of uh, uh, India towards uh, China's threat, and Oman now has started to play an important role within the uh, uh, Indian strategy, and there are companies now uh, which are uh, boosting their uh, presence in uh, Oman. And uh, India is, uh, might be expecting uh, certain threats and attacks. And they think that uh, uh, Gulf GCC countries can play an important role in s the uh, security of uh, India. From another side, uh, and the importance of India, the India is an emerging uh, country, and uh, they are in the seventh position uh, in uh, uh, the world economy. And the IMF uh, expects that at the end of this year, they will uh, uh, climb to the fifth place after the United States, China. And this uh, makes uh, uh, it for difficult to ignore, uh, for the GCC countries to ignore such uh, an important and uh, powerful economic power. Therefore, India will remain a very important market for the GCC countries, for the gas of Qatar or the oil in other uh, Gulf countries. Some uh, quick statistics. India is the third uh, biggest uh, importer of uh, uh, oil and fourth of uh, LNG uh, importer, and they might become third. And there are uh, huge opportunities in fields like uh, refining uh, refineries, LNGs, electricity, and also providing uh, specialized manpower uh, for the Gulf market. This uh, table uh, reflects the development, economical de development of India uh, through 10 years, and India will go from the 12th position to the uh, third biggest economy in the world. As I said before, this, uh, this uh, growth will need uh, energy resources, and this graph graphics uh, reflects uh, the augmenting needs of uh, energy, which will uh, double in 2030 and then in 2040. Same thing for the gas, LNG, which will increase uh, continuously. And this uh, might be good news for a country like Qatar to remain a main provider uh, for a country <coughs> like India. Quickly, uh, quick points. 
Uh, so there is some optimism but the relations might not be that easy uh, in the future there might be obstacles and challenges among those is the situation of India in uh, the investment field uh, India is in the hundredth position in uh, uh, investment uh, facilities because of corruption and uh, uh, administrative procedures. There is a possibility also that uh, the energy prices could increase and this uh, might affect uh, uh, India in particular uh, where the deficit uh, is due uh, in a big proportion to the uh, energy sector and India will try to balance by uh, increasing their ex exports toward uh, Arab uh, markets also, the uh, problems between India and Pakistan, also foreign competition. Uh, Iraq is uh, uh, in competition with the Gulf countries, and they are the uh, f first position in uh, providing oil uh, to uh, India. Russia also is, uh, uh, as well as uh, uh, Indian companies, which are now having contracts with U.S. Uh, countries. The necessary steps to be uh, taken to improve the relations between India and the Gulf countries, some people would uh, 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 could con uh, consider it as a wishful thinking, but I think that uh, uh, there is a need to institutionalize the, the cooperation between the countries and also uh, uh, putting an end to the crisis uh, in relations with uh, the GCC and uh, uh, reinforce uh, the uh, position of uh, the GCC countries uh, because they will have a better position in the Indian market. Also signing uh, a free uh, trade uh, agreement between India and the G GCC countries would uh, facilitate the relations uh, to develop uh, an institutional uh, formula through strategic uh, dialogue uh, in relation with the food security. So there is a need to have a, a formula of a dialogue between uh, Gulf countries and, and and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nasser. We move now to the third uh, speaker, Dr. Girgash Pant, uh, retired professor, faculty of uh, international study from Jawaharlal Nehru in uh, India. He was uh, dean uh, of the faculty down in uh, India. His uh, interests uh, and uh, publications are related to following uh, fields and issues. Uh, West Asia, Gulf countries, uh, and uh, also international energy, Indian uh, energy security relations between Gulf uh, countries uh, and uh, India. He's uh, conducting research uh, currently on uh, energy sector in India. He's going to talk about the change in context uh, of uh, Indian uh, Arab relations uh, in uh, energy sector. Doctor. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would like to uh, record here uh, thanks to the Center for giving us this opportunity. 
uh, especially organizing a very exclusive conference on India's relation with the Arab world in general and the uh, Arab Gulf countries in particular. Because uh, in this age of hyper, hyper information, there is a huge gap of information between India and the Gulf countries. Uh, uh, when I'm saying gap, I have in my mind the kind of a understanding which should be there to realize the potential be that is being talked about. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, this session is basically to reflect upon the future uh, aspect of it. So I will take energy as an as a instrument to look at the, the, the future development which one can visualize, how, sh how can one construct it. Uh, since I noticed that there are three papers on energy, I assume that lots of data will be covered and uh, my, uh, my assessment was not wrong because both the uh, presenters have given lots of data. So I have, uh, after coming here, I've uh, re reshuffled my slides and cut down the uh, data part of it. Now, um, energy relations today are no more the binary between the producers and ex uh, consumers, you see. The energy world today is much more complex. And therefore, uh, to assume that India's relation, energy relation with the Arab Gulf countries will be only a buyer and sellers will be an oversimplification and possibly a very outdated kind of a construct. So what I am trying to argue here is to look at the entire project into a very wider context. And that would I would like to say that the two proposition that is link west, that's how India is articulating its relationship with the Gulf countries. And look east, that is how the, the, the Gulf countries are articulating their foreign policy orientation. And this has to be seen in a wider geostrategic frame. Now, when I say wider geostrategic frame, what do I have in my mind? First thing is that if you look at the global order, there's a huge disruption going on there, you see. Uh, the, the pace by which the technology is coming, the old uh, assumptions are turning uh, irrelevant, the institutions are not able to functional, and then this huge element of post-truth, you see. Now, this, this, this has totally changed the entire context of the kind of the global imagination which we had after the Cold War, we thought that the new order is going to emerge, but we don't, we don't see at the in the immediate future any kind of a contours emerging of a kind of global order. The Asian century was emerging as a kind of a hope, but I would like to submit here for your consideration that it still remains is in search of coherence. Uh, there was a time when we assumed that possibly China, India are going to provide a lead to this project, but the way the Chinese have gone up the way the Chinese are visualizing the Asian construct, not only Asian construct, the way they are visualizing the global construct, which is, uh, the, which is uh, uh, you know, reflected in the entire project, uh, one road, one belt project, very clearly demonstrate that there's a huge uh, asymmetry of power is emerging in Asia. Therefore, with, the, with this asymmetry of power, what kind of an Asian uh, uh, you know, century is going to emerge is a, is a big uh, question mark. One will have to talk about it. Now, I, a third point which I have mentioned is the Arab world which is negotiating its bearing that where we are, I mean, this is a question which Arab worlds are talking about or where we are going. Now, this is an issue which is bothering in their mind, especially after the Arab uprising. Uh, then the India, which is, uh, I, uh, is, a, is emerging as an emerging economy, uh, I have my reservation to say whether it is an emerging power because in India has yet to acquire that, uh, that economic quotient which can provide you a threshold to become a power is the yet to come. But the, the, that India is emerging as a, uh, as a powerful economy, as a rising economy, cannot be dismissed. Therefore, Indian economy will be looking for a very robust kind of a global engagement. And um, what we find in case of especially Arab Gulf countries, there is a desire to redefine what is being called the new normal, you see. Now, this new normal provides you a huge space, a new space, where possibly India can locate its, its relationship with the Gulf countries. So therefore, I have tried to submit here that look east and link west is an expression of intent or to strategize the shared mutual interest. That is how I would like to construct the future of India Arab or India's relation with the Arab Gulf countries. Since we are talking about energy, is by and large about the Arab Gulf countries we are talking of. Now, in the context of the uh, Indo-Arab relation, or, uh, I, I would like to define it that it is a mutual contribution to the respective strategic autonomy that should be the per perspective of our engagement or a kind of a roadmap 
where we would like to visualize the relationship should go about it you see the strategic autonomy uh, in its dynamic connotation means that constant engagement with the innovative processes to acquire knowledge power to defend and promote a national interest in multipolar global configuration that is that is the basic premise around which i would like to imagine the future of india's relation with the gulf countries in the context of the energy strategic autonomy would mean a comprehensive engagement to ensure and promote energy interdependence to obtain the respective goals that's how i would like that the future should emerge now that when we are talking of when we look at the india uh, india's uh, relationship with the gulf countries uh, we look at the global energy landscape as a backdrop and we find that the oil market is not so uncomfortable as it used to be earlier but it remains a geopolitically fragile so, so it will have a bearing on india's uh, uh, energy relation with the region uh, we have much more supply sources it much more diversified there are many more countries outside other than the opec which are emerging as a player and not to mention the fact that the us is now looking for energy as a kind of not indip energy independence but as a source of domination of the power structure this is the shift from obama to 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 uh, to the present uh, president uh, the next aspect is that the oil demand is as we know is shifted to the asia and therefore asia becomes the energy stakes of the region is uh, of the gulf countries are inevitably going to be the asian uh, continent and the next issue the issue which is emerging into the energy landscape is that the oil power uh, opec power is being restrained by the non opec i don't want to elaborate because as you know about it that the, the way the oil prices were going down it could only be uh, restored because, because of there is a agreement between the opec and the russia and other non opec supplier to to cut down the output and then, and the last point which is going to have a bearing about it is that the, the oil demand is peaking because the efficiency is making it a flat europe uh, in europe you will find that the energy demand uh, demand has been almost uh, flattened china is also talking of the peaking of the oil demand in another 10 years time in india also gradually evidences are coming that the the, the uh, oil demand is not going cor in correspondence to the economic growth rate so one is the, one is finding the bearing of the efficiency factor emerging out of the technology is going to have its impact on the future oil demand globally not to mention the asian countries uh, as well and the last point which is possibly is much more serious point is that we are talking of after the paris uh, agreement we are talking of the purposive transition to renewable that the countries are now being committed to move away from to, to from oil to the renewable sector and that is where this is not that the oil is over it is largely because we have an agreement we have a commitment that if we have to save our climate we have to move beyond the oil sector and many countries including indian prime minister has also de has declared that we will be cutting down our oil import by another 10% in the coming times so all these factors has they going to have their bearing on india's energy relations with the gulf countries now when we look from the indian lens you find that india is indian growing india is a growing economy but it is trapped in the energy poverty you see a, therefore india will be needing all forms of energy uh, and uh, uh, that is that, that is very clearly demonstrated by if one looks at the india's energy mix Uh, second point is that energy i mean if energy is divided into hydrocarbon and the renewable then we uh, we are very we are not richly endowed in terms of the hydrocarbons uh, it is true that we have yet to explore our geology well uh, uh, quite often we get the kind of uh, uh, information that new gas is found etc etc but the 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 some uh, the some substance uh, is that uh, we have yet to map our geology and we are not sure about it that how how competitively we will be able to harness this so therefore uh, 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 the energy security going to remain india's quest and uh, that is has its bearing on uh, its relationship the next point which i would like to mention here while india is going to be emerging as a second largest energy consumer as a huge market now this certainly makes india vulnerable but it also provides india leverage you see 
that to tomorrow no energy exporter country, I'm talking the hydrocarbon exporting country, can afford to ignore the in India's energy market. Even, I mean, if, if you are going to be an energy consumer more than Chinese, you can imagine that anyone who wants to be in the, in the oil and gas market will have no choice but to negotiate with India. So therefore, this, this is a kind of new, new strength which India derives from its market potential, though it also makes it vulnerable, as I mentioned earlier. And the last point is that the, the India today is very, very actively committed to the kind of a moving toward the energy transition. Uh, uh, and this is very evident if you go, if you are following the kind of, and which I'll mention now subsequently, that we are very, going with a very huge pace toward the renewable energy. And the thrust of India's energy policy to, to, is that we should move as fast as possible. Sometimes the targets are the target look very ambitious, but uh, that is how our intent is. Now, if we look at from the energy exporters perspective, when they are looking for the new normal, the one of the biggest challenge for them is going to be the retaining the market share and defending defending the price. That is one of the huge challenge the uh, Gulf countries will be facing there. Then there is a new second issue which they are facing is that a new engagement with the Asian, uh, Asian market. That is to say that they are, would like to move beyond exporting the crude. Uh, then the third issue which I have mentioned here is that there is a huge pressure that cut down the domestic consumption because number of studies are arguing that the highly subsidized energy in this region will not give them the leverage to export beyond 10 years or 20 years period of time. Uh, therefore, uh, they, they have no choice but to cut down their domestic consumption. And also we find that bo all, almost all the Gulf countries are uh, you know, pursuing uh, a, a, very, a very vigorous kind of a strategy toward the energy transition. So this is the perspective emerging from the, uh, uh, from the uh, Arab uh, exporting countries. Now, if I look at the Indo-Arab re energy relation in the age of transition, as we are talking about it, uh, then the first point is there that uh, it is no hydrocarbon alone in, in energy relation in the in the age of energy transition the the relations are not going to remain confined to hydrocarbon uh, energy transition is a reality is a commitment uh, both the consumer and producers are engaged in there and the technology is playing playing very disruptive role in this you see uh, energy is the another point which I'm going to make here which is going to have a bearing is that the energy order is not likely to be dominated by only a few players we are going to witness uh, many more players, and possibly energy may no, no, no more be the subject of security. Uh, now, in a, the, in the concept of energy security, I am making I'm suggesting here: the, the, it, ten years down the line, this word, the, it, this, it will be away from the lexicon that there is something called energy security, and I can argue about it if the time permits. Now, the Indian story, when we look at. Uh, 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 <laughs> So I'll, I'll, uh, uh, I will cut down these things, but I want to bring um, your attention to the area that we are, uh, we, I, I would like, I'm uh, advocating this uh, um, morning here that there is a huge relationship, possible relationship between India and the Gulf countries as far as energy concerned in the, um, uh, um, I mean, I, I'm escaping the uh, oil and gas sector because th that is already being talked about. I would like to emphasize that uh, um, uh, that beyond uh, beyond hydrocarbon, there is arrival of uh, renewable <laughs> taking place, and renewable. I, I, I'm emphasizing because here in renewable, uh, unlike the unlike the oil and gas sector where we don't have resources, we have enough solar radiation that if we can harness it, possibly India will not need as much of the en energy import as it is being talked about, and that ensures us about the energy security. So the future of India's, uh, any search of energy security lies with the re renewables energy. And therefore, uh, uh, I would like to submit here that, uh, and as I, I have mentioned in my slides, that the Gulf countries are also looking for uh, a transition to the uh, to renewable. Uh, uh, the the point I would like to argue here is that in in the ener in harnessing the uh, energy uh, renewable energy, particularly the solar energy, there is a huge possibility of engagement with the Gulf countries 
on basically involving into the entire innovation processes you see unlike the hydrocarbon sector where the gulf countries have totally depended upon the in, uh, import of technology and uh, uh, you know the, the renewable provides a huge opportunity for india as well as gulf countries to be the partner in the entire innovation processes because the solar energy again to define that there is a divide between the those those who control the technology and those who need the solar energy you see and there are those who have the solar radiations so therefore it is a time that the india and the gulf countries uh, uh would like we should get engaged into some from the basics of the energy engagement which i would like to call as a r and d alliances that unless until we don't become a partner in research and development alliances and go for the joining the provide the innovation lead this is a huge opportunity which can help us to provide uh, you know a uh, 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 play a, a role into the making of the new architecture of the uh, uh, renewable energy uh, we have already signed a kind of agreement with uae uh, in this context i will not elaborate on this uh, uh, but the point which i would like that to mention here uh, because the time is not much here is uh, that india has taken a lead in making a uh, uh, mm, sorry india uh, taken a lead in terms of making an international solar alliance and um, in this international solar alliance the uh, th um, the the purpose of basically is that is not to create any kind of a block the purpose is basically to recognize that the role of an uh, research and development in creating the technology in the system within the countries to the requirement of the context which we are talking of there it is also you know we we have already uh, uae has recently joined it and we are trying to persuade saudi arabia to join it because this is a major this is a major departure where the india is trying to provide a kind of a leading role not the leadership but the leading role uh, of course it has been supported by the france and we are expecting that it will provide a platform of sharing knowledge on the on the uh, on the on technology on the innovation processes this is important because many of you might have recognized this point that solar energy or the renewable energy also provide a huge opportunity to create entrepreneurship and i have argued in my uh, in, in in my paper that the some of the new areas where india can partner to or energy can be a partnership to promote entrepreneurship in the region could be the the possibility of engagement with the energy startups you see uh, india has a very robust uh, energy startups are coming there and we we would like that the, uh, one also comes to know that the, in the gulf countries also the this culture of startup is coming up indian government is promoting in a very as a as a as a cons uh, conscious efforts these startup i would like to argue that this startup partnership between india and the gulf countries will pave way for the rise of the entrepreneurship because the no the new normal of gulf countries can be possible only if the state gives up its economic activities and the private sector or entrepreneurship emerge in the region and the, it is where in that kind of a context i see the future of uh, uh, of of uh, of and, and that the energy can uh, can play a role Uh, uh in in promoting uh, india's uh, in uh, relation with india and the gulf countries i'll finally read the last uh, slide and uh, i'll finish it i'm sorry i have to uh, i have also mentioned that how the digitalization is influencing the solar industry that again can be an area of cooperation i have mentioned here and uh, how the uh, a uh, one point which i would like to mention here while the with the with the, uh, with the technology coming to the region in we are facing in india the problem and i am sure the gulf countries will also have the problem the compatibility of the skill formation now this can be another area where india and the gulf countries can play very important role that you you work together on the skill formation and india is going in a very big way uh recognizing the fact that and that uh, i don't have to uh, mention the fact that this skill formation will make not only the uh, uh, the the uh, the energy sector to run but also be a source of employment and the unemployment is an issue not only in india but the gulf country as well and m uh, this employment is of the kind which the so called pampered middle class india uh, middle class in gulf countries will not able to hesitate it because you don't have to dirty your hand there it's is a is a is a is a is a cerebral kind of activities uh so uh, so i would like to say that i would like that we should reimagine the india's arab relationship 
because with the pace and the agenda of the global economy set by the process of innovation and technology and aspirant society of millennial generation, India and Arab countries have no choice to be, to be engaged with, no, no choice but to be engaged with the global trajectory. Energy sector, as spelled out in this presentation, has the potential to graduate the relationship to the knowledge mode. Apparently, as knowledge partner, the two will not only be reviving the much celebrated historical engagement, but will be putting it on the future pedestal. If Asian century is, is the possibility, West Asia has to be in its ambit, and India as emerging economy, not as much a power, could play a critical role in this transition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gap. Shukran, Dr. Pant. We have listened to three presentations about uh, uh, energy resources which are not used properly and that there is a way to uh, boost the cooperation and uh, that uh, there are no free trade uh, agreements be, uh, with any Arab countries and that might be an obstacle and uh, uh, also maybe there is a need to redefine uh, the nature of the relationship in order to promote the relations for a development uh, alliance and uh, cooperate in uh, innovation and uh, India uh, seems to be uh, an innovating country and the uh, startup uh, uh, initiatives and uh, there are obstacles which uh, we could work upon we have uh, about uh, half an hour for questions so we will take uh, around six questions from the attendance could you please introduce yourself Samir Sifan, uh, researcher in uh, the uh, Arab Center. Oh, the microphone, 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 microphone. I have a wish and a question. The wish to build uh, upon this uh, conference. I wish that the uh, researchers participating here to contribute uh, uh, by the researchers or papers uh, so that they are uh, published in uh, the publications of the center, the quarterly uh, uh, publications to uh, raise the awareness and uh, inform more about the relations between India and the Arab world. My question is about India as a raising power need a lot of uh, investments and the uh, uh, Gulf countries uh, have uh, investing uh, resources but they are not in, uh, invested in uh, India. The, uh, the investments, the Indian investments uh, carry with them uh, know-how and uh, knowledge and experience. So why don't the uh, Gulf investments go to India? Uh, we heard that uh, there is a corruption problem and uh, obstacles and the uh, bad investment uh, environment, uh, it is made to protect some uh, 
uh, companies how what makes this uh, what is the nature of uh, this corruption situation in India and is there any remedy for that in the future thank you thank you professor Samir Dr. Muhannad from Iraq Dr. Mohammed Azhar, uh, you spoke about the uh, economic relations and uh, trade between the two entities. We have neglected uh, an important uh, aspect in the uh, air uh, relation activities. There are uh, more than 1,000 flights uh, between uh, the two entities, India and the Arab world. Uh, Dr. Nasser, uh, thank you for the valuable information. And what is the, uh, the, the energy is the main uh, uh, level of cooperation between the countries. We, you talked about renew, renewable uh, energy resources. We are talking about uh, finding an alternative, but uh, petrol is or oil is important. If there is a renewable energy, how will we sustain our economy? Thank you. Uh, my question is to Professor. N name and affiliation, please. I'm Javed Ahmed Khan from India. My question is to both Professor Girjesh Pant and Professor Mohammed Azhar. Both have talked about the energy and beyond. And my question is whether you can imagine about the sovereign welfare fund of the Gulf states this one aspect and another very important aspect to my mind is, in, especially in, in this age of globalization, the inflow and outflow of capital through the portfolio investment. How you can imagine beyond this, uh, beyond this energy trade, the attraction of Arab fund, for example, into the Indian market, keeping in view the Arab psyche. I mean Arab psyche. They are very much interested in do the equity financing, where they see the joint venture types of investment for a long term uh, rate of return. How we can imagine the India's attractive market for the Arab Gulf through these two very important source of uh, investment, portfolio investment and sovereign welfare funds. The question is about the around 9 million manpower uh, of Indians. I think uh, there is a very important uh, fact about that. Uh, nobody is talking about this uh, silent uh, Indian lobby in the uh, Gulf countries. Uh, uh, some people were saying that if there is a, a, a Gulf uh, uh, spring in the area, it will be an Indian spring. The Emirates uh, tried to expatriate uh, many uh, Indians, many who are illegally uh, residing there. So they sent them to uh, uh, India and India uh, sent them back and the uh, Emirates government didn't, couldn't do anything about that. So I think that these nine million, we should not look at them as a manpower uh, figure, but we can uh, consider them as 
more than that. Um, this is uh, A.K. Pasha from Delhi, JNU. Uh, this is uh, to Dr. Nasser al-Tamimi. Uh, you know, in India, the price of uh, uh, petroleum, uh, uh, petrol and diesel, uh, is now largely deregulated. On a day-to-day -day basis, uh, the prices rise or decline. Uh, in fact, um, most of the states and the central government, they levy customs duty. And uh, in many states, the duties which are imposed are the largest source of uh, revenues. For example, the southern state of Karnataka, uh, it is not so much the taxes, but the revenue from the taxes imposed on diesel and uh, petrol. Keeping this in mind, uh, it is seen as uh, a revenue opportunity for most uh, states. And there are demands to bring it under a single generalized uh, system of uh, tariff, GST. This is one point. The other point is uh, one of our colleagues from the academy here talked about uh, uh, corruption and other uh, impediments to uh, uh, investments. Mr. Chairman, I'm bringing it to your uh, attention. Uh, some time back, uh, the, one of the ministers from your neighboring country uh, was talking about uh, iron-clad guarantees for uh, investments from uh, the Gulf uh, region. And the conditions which he spoke was much more stringent than the IMF. And the promise was about $75 billion of sovereign wealth fund, which was earlier made by Saudi Arabia also almost 10 years ago when the Prime Minister visited uh, Riyadh. Uh, the infrastructure needs were mentioned as something like uh, uh, 30, $300 billion. But the investments from the Gulf countries has been uh, very limited not only because of the issue of corruption, but also the guarantees which are sought by the investors uh, are much more stringent uh, uh, than we had anticipated. And also, being a democracy, many of the investors have had to face court cases in which uh, Indian courts have uh, taken decisions which have proved very detrimental to the foreign inv investors. So in that way, the lack of uh, enthusiasm on the part of uh, investors in the Indian economy is because of a combination of uh, corruption, uh, the uh, intervention by judiciary, and also the press, which picks up uh, issues even before the deals are finalized. For example, there was one potential Qatari investor who wanted to invest in renewable energy through a Malaysian firm. And uh, it was leaked out and it became virtually a scandal. And the whole uh, thing fizzled out. So the kind of uh, leadership and decision making which is common here in the Gulf region, they expect the same from India. So that is the real uh, problem. Nothing can be hidden there. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question to Mr. Nasir Tamimi. How do you see the role of China uh, in the Gulf region? Particularly, uh, do you see that any competitive relationship between China and India? Uh, China is not related at all in this region with its uh, uh, workforce, which India has almost 7 million. Uh, Chinese don't have that. I, I don't know if they have even uh, uh, any amount of uh, uh, workforce here. But in terms of defense and security cooperation between China and Saudi Arabia particularly, I think it is increasing day by day. And there are other countries uh, which are joining China in defense and security. So uh, if this defense and security relationship is uh, going to increase, how do you see the role of India uh, 
vis-à-vis -vis China uh, between these countries? Is it going to affect India's India uh, uh, part also? Uh, now the speakers will try to answer the questions. We we'll start by Dr. Tamimi. Quick points for the uh, investment uh, environment. For the Gulf countries, there are uh, other types of uh, obstacles. The Indian uh, uh, companies have uh, uh, tough competition from Western uh, uh, companies. And the prices also, the Chinese companies offer uh, better uh, uh, prices. There were some uh, agreements with the Emirates, and I think that uh, the participation of Indian companies in the Gulf will increase. Also, the oil uh, services, the Indian companies have uh, a lot of know-how, and also the security of energy uh, companies, the cyber security. They can uh, uh, be for the investment are uh, uh, very low. Uh, uh, it's only three billion uh, dollars, and for a country, huge country like India, three billions is not a lot. I think uh, uh, if India goes further in. Uh, uh, finding solution for the problems, for the corruption, and etc. I think there will be a, a possibility for more investments. India uh, needs uh, investments in the infrastructure, and there are negotiations now with uh, Qataris and with Aramco also. And I uh, expect that uh, uh, India, India will be considered more seriously in, uh, as for the investments of uh, uh, Gulf countries. For Dr. Nawaf, uh, 9 million uh, manpower, I mentioned that there are Indian fears and Gulf fears, so that's why it is necessary to have a strategic dialogue uh, uh, if you provoke uh, India, they might uh, respond that's why uh, it is only through a strategic dialogue that things should be uh, approached. I think that this is the way that uh, India and uh, Gulf countries should follow. For the role of China, I think uh, uh, they are, both parties are contributing in the uh, security of uh, the area. And stability is very important for India and China. And this might uh, encourage both parties to cooperate with the uh, countries of this area in uh, hacking and uh, cyber hacking, <coughs> but if we move to Sri Lanka, Bangladesh and this area, there are Indian fears from China. And we wish that doesn't happen if uh, problems uh, go uh, further than that. It might uh, reflect on this uh, Gulf area. Uh, I would like to uh, comment on this issue of corruption and things. 
you see uh, uh, first thing is that corruption is uh, not an issue as far as the foreign investment is concerned is more than uh, corruption it is the inefficiency which matters there which creates a problem for them corruption is largely a domestic issue uh, but uh, what we are talking today in india is uh, that is uh, uh, ease of doing business index is being talked about and uh, recently india has situation in this ease of doing business has improved it second point is that uh, you know um, the priorities of the gulf investment and the priority of the indian government at time it becomes you know there is a kind of a disjuncture for instance if you are interested in having a huge huge land there for a project uh, indian society getting land for the state is not a easy thing because there huge popular upsurge takes place there and therefore which is something which is not very familiar to the in, uh, investor coming from the gulf country to the region there that even for indian nuclear plants quite often the civil society and the people will make resistance so it's a, you know what i would i'm i'm raising this concern for your consideration that today what i find is that uh, sovereign wealth fund find comfort in china because it's a strong state sovereign wealth fund find doesn't find comfort in india because it's a demo democratic state you see now the choice is that kind of trade off the kind of trade off which you have to do that if you want to have a huge sovereign fund in that conditionality that how do you going to engage with your democratic concern which are coming in in the society and is still please remember the fact that india is still transiting the democratization process the there is a huge you know upsurge about the about the uh, uh, the human right concerns about the uh, various movement which are coming there and they all create a kind of a difficulty in that kind of ease which a foreign investment is looking for india so that if india is pitted against a strong state like china we 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 will not able to compete it you see but at the same time if there is a if there is a possibility of emerging democratic forces in other part of the globe they will be able to appreciate the concern uh, indian concern and possibly the much more flow of the investment will take place so i do visualize this engagement with india uh, uh, not as a, you know as a process which can possibly contribute in deepening of the uh, or expand expansion of the political space in in, uh, in 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 other partners including in the gulf countries if that happens Uh, you will find that it will be much more comfortable of kind of investment in place with india and because quite often what happens the when the political leadership comes to india then we are told that so many billions are going to come to india if it is a political decision i am afraid india is not a very right kind of a choice you see so that is the problem when you are looking for a kind of a flow of investment coming from sovereign fund to india despite the fact that india is looking for a huge investment we are looking for huge investment in infrastructure that is our priority and uh, quite often uh, you know uh, we are disappointed that that kind of investment is not coming because the comfort which is as i mentioned the comfort which is provided by the strong state you know goes against us thank you Dr. Azhar. Dr. Azhar, the floor is yours. Microphone, oh, yeah. Uh, microphone, please. Microphone. Despite all information and talks on corruption and obstacles and the negative environment, India has been. one of the largest recipients of fdi in the world of course it has been from the industrial countries it has been from the from the developed countries they have they they are able to invest there because they have the fully developed infrastructure for such kind of activities which of course the the arab countries lack well when again it comes to the investment from the arab countries let us see where they have invested they have invested globally in the real estate hmm in the land it is not permissible in india no foreigner can buy a land there so that sector is gone then comes the islamic banking 
lot of the Islamic banks in Gulf have lot of funds. They want to invest it. They are investing all over the world. Unfortunately, we do not have it. Maybe after some time, we could have it. But now, at this point, we do not have it. So also that large chunk is gone. Then comes the investment of these countries all over the world in the energy sector, oil sector. To achieve the horizontal integration of their investments in the, in the, in the foreign countries and the local industry, these countries have been investing in the energy sector all over the world. Now, as, the, as India is opening, we find that they are, they are moving to India, like the, the Aramco. They are moving there in, in, in refinery. They want to be in retail. So we should not consider that one day the, the gates are removed and there is flood. It does not happen in the investments. It has to be steady. It has to be guided through the market, market fundamentals. So it takes time. And I am sure that an important chunk of the Gulf investment will go to the India also. Maybe slow. Uh, as far as the flights are concerned, the point is well taken because this may be the busiest sector in the world and maybe the largest uh, uh, quantum of people travel along these two regions. Hmm? This is a very important uh, observation and this is, this is well taken. Uh, about the sovereign welfare fund and the inflow and outflow of portfolio investment, I think I have already discussed above. The sovereign welfare fund, of course, they are not freely, freely market determined. There, there are some political, political decisions involved in it and that, that the other speakers have already explained. As far as portfolio investment is concerned, it is also, it is also going to open, inshallah. As far as the, the, the 9 million uh, or 8.5 million or whatever manpower in, 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 in the Gulf countries, Indians are concerned. See, the Indians are the most docile people. And they have a lot of political activity in their own country. Hmm? I, when I was in England, my uh, um, students of my, they were very, very, uh, very, very, uh, in fact, um, uh, obsessive about the elections for the mosque committee. So I was thinking, what is happening that they are so obsessive about the mosque committee? And I am not. So I thought, oh, it is because we have the we have lot of democracy in our country, so we no need to be active here. So what I want to say that we have lot of lot of political space. Indians have lot of political space back in India. They come here only for earning and improving their life. The first thing that an Indian does, what he does, back home he builds a good and beautiful home. <laughs> the meaning that he knows he wants to go back by earning. So I think, and there is no serious violations in any of the, any of the countries by Indians. They are, I think if, if, if a ranking takes place, Indian manpower is the most disciplined, rank, uh, most disciplined workforce in these countries. And this is why they are loved, they are accepted, and they are given jobs. So I think any concern on that part is not warranted. Uh, I think, thank you very much, sir. I'd like to thank uh, my speakers uh, for their presentations. I'd like to thank also the audience uh, for their uh, uh, questions. I, I invite you to the lunch. Thank you very much.